Thinking about Easter, just brought to mind this story I'd heard about this lady named March who was washing dishes one day in her, in her kitchen and looking out in the yard, and then she looked up and saw her dog shaking the life out of the neighbor's pet rabbit. You know, and she's like, no, this is the neighbor that they'd been having problems with. And there was the dog shaking that thing and fur is flying. And like, no, and she runs out with a broom and the dog thinks this is a big game and running away from her. And finally, the dog drops the rabbit and she pokes it with the broom. It's dead. Ding, ding, ding. You know, and it's covered in mud and dog saliva and all that. And just, oh man, she picks that, that rabbit up with the end of the broom and carries it into the house and, and drops it into the tub, turns the shower on, washing the muck out of that fur and then kind of flips it over with the broom and gets the, the mud out of the other side. And she's like, what do I do? What do I do? And so she's like, hmm. And as the mud goes out, she's like, you know, it doesn't look that bad. So she takes the rabbit out and grabs an old rag and dries it off and then gets the blow dryer. Has, finds an old comb and starts back combing this rabbit. And, and pretty soon it actually starts to look pretty good, you know. And so she's like, okay, you know. And she's watching the neighbor. And then she notices the neighbor has, has driven away quickly. And she, she grabs that rabbit and, and, and looks around and hustles into the backyard, opens the cage, puts the rabbit, kind of leans it against the wire, you know, there, closes the cage and runs back to the house. Like, okay, whew, I think I dodged that one. I don't want to, you know, get in trouble for this. And so she, she's just kind of waiting, you know. And, and the neighbor comes back. And, and all of a sudden she hears this screaming. My rabbit, my rabbit. And she's like, why? You know, so she kind of walks to the fence as though she doesn't know what's going on. Oh, really? What happened? You know, she's like, our rabbit. It died two weeks ago and we buried it. And it's back in the cage. <laughs> you know, there it is. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh. Who would have known, eh? <laughs> That's not an original story with me. But anyway, it's just a good one to tell. I raised rabbits. I had that experience of seeing a, a pet dog, you know, shake a rabbit. So I, I, it's not a nice feeling. I, I know. But some people treat the Easter story like that rabbit. It's just something that comes out of the ground every year, once a year, and you blow dry it, comb it, put it back in the cage, and leave it there till next year. And it's meant to be so much more than that. It's meant to actually make a difference in our lives, uh, not only today, but, but, but you know, for the future and, and, and for every day. Because so, so usually we think about Easter and the cross in terms of what Christ did for us. And, then, and the resurrection in terms of what's going to happen to us someday, right? And, and then there's this middle zone of like, well, so what now? And every Easter we come to Easter and we do our thing. I remember as a kid, I loved Easter. We'd go to Edmonton and we'd gather with aunts and uncles, and we'd eat Ukrainian food, but there was not a lot of sacredness to our, our gatherings. They were always fun and great, uh, but there was just, not, you know, there, just, there was something absent. Our family knew what that was. It, was. it was this story of a risen Christ. And so I'm so thankful for, for uh, Irene and Patrick last week who, who just pre-set the stage for Easter with a baptism. Because in the Bible, baptism is, is the picture of Easter, and every time we see a baptism, every time we, you know, participate in one or watch and celebrate, I mean, it's just a reminder of the Easter story, the reality of death, burial, and resurrection. And so instead of dealing with these historical accounts in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, I'm just going to jump into the book of Romans this morning in one verse and just unpack a little bit about what is the significance of of what happened that day. Because you see, it, it's intended to have a result for you right now. Not just, yes, when you die, you get to go to heaven and have a resurrected body, but it's actually supposed to have impact and make a difference today. 
And maybe you came here today, maybe you're watching online, and you're like, man, I just need something because my life isn't working right now. And the truth about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is intended to make that difference in your life. Our whole church is named after this reality, new life. Without that, there wouldn't be a church. We wouldn't be doing this right now. We'd, who knows what would be happening? But because it did happen, we're here, and, and, and 2,000 years later, still celebrating this event, and it's still making a difference today in people's lives. So here's the verse. It's Romans 6, verse 4. And he says, We have, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so he's talking about three things I want to draw out of this verse. The first is, you know, you experienced that that death reality when you were buried with Christ in baptism. In the first century, uh, baptism was what happened. You, you would believe in Jesus Christ. You would come to this intellectual understanding and, 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 a, and a reorientation of your will to believe the truth about Jesus' death and resurrection and who he said he was and what he did. And then you would follow up that internal belief with the outward display of, of, of your commitment by being baptized. Usually almost simultaneous. You believed, you were baptized. You weren't really fully accepted or, or recognized as being in until you made it public. They didn't have secret believers or unbaptized followers of Jesus Christ. That didn't happen in the Bible. I, I, I've not found that person anywhere in the Scripture. They don't exist. You believe, you made a public declaration that you were a follower of Jesus Christ. And that was symbolic of death. Let's leave that verse up there. Just leave it up there, all right? Just leave it up there. That's good, yep. Yeah. It was symbolic of death. Now, I've gone to a lot of gravesides because I've officiated at funerals. And, and usually, you know, the funeral comes and you do all the things you do at a funeral and, and you talk and you, you know, visit and, you know, and, and there's a few tears and, you know, and it just gets usually gentle kind of tears coming down during the service. And then you get to the graveside and I do my little thing there. I, you know, read some scripture. I, I pray a prayer. I do a benediction and the, the final flowers are laid. And then I instruct the funeral director to lower the casket. And that's usually when it hits. Anyone that's been holding back, it's usually there that I see the most guttural responses. The sobbing that just comes from the, the inner part of the soul that just makes everyone go, ooh, death. And when that casket goes down, it's final. He or she is gone. And the scripture says that we have been buried with him in baptism. It is symbolic of this reality that we are supposed to die in Christ. That when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are turning from whatever we held on to before to fully embrace him and him alone. So whatever we used to use as crutches to get through life are gone. I don't need booze anymore. I don't need money anymore. I don't need to to try to look better anymore because I have found in Christ everything that I need. I don't need to prove something to a family that never acknowledged my existence or my worth. Jesus acknowledges my existence and my worth. I don't need to carry the guilt and the shame and the names and all the stuff that was plopped on me as a a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. That's over because I have embraced Jesus Christ. And the baptism is the picture of that. The problem that you and I have when it comes to experiencing the resurrection and that daily reality is that sometimes we're just lingering around the casket a little too long. We're not letting it go down so that we can move forward with new life. In uh, Operation Desert Storm, I know some of you, only the old people will understand what I'm talking about, but there was a little conflict in the, in the Middle East and Kuwait and Iraq, and, and, the, and actually what happened was all these American soldiers were, were turning to Christ because, well, you don't know, are you going to live? And what happens if I die? Well, I got I to gotta do something. So they were turning to Christ. They were believing in Jesus Christ. The chaplain was like, and they want to get baptized. He's like, what do I do? There's no water. We're in the desert. The one receptacle available to be used for baptism, guess what it was? A casket. (laughs) How's that for symbolism? (laughs) 
We've been buried with him through baptism into death. Jesus invites you to die with him. To leave your sinfulness, your shame, your guilt behind and to experience something new and fresh with him. And you can't get to resurrection until we have crucifixion. I mean, Christ died, and and on the cross, the penalty for our sins was placed upon him. He bore that. Uh, The shame, the guilt, all of that garbage that defines us was placed upon Jesus. Because that was the fundamental problem with our world. It is the fundamental problem with our world. It's sin. Try to fix it with all these other things, but the Bible makes it really clear that, that this issue of us not following and not embracing God's way is the what gives us the biggest problems in our lives and in the world. And Jesus comes and says, I'm making a way out of that. And individually and personally, we receive Christ, we believe in him, and then we publicly make that declaration in baptism. And that's symbolic of the reality that, yes, the old person is gone. Some of you might have friends, you know, from your past life. And you encounter them, and they talk about the past life, right? Like, yeah, I remember when we, you know, and, and you probably feel a little bit embarrassed in those moments because you're like, yeah, but, and you just need to be like, yeah, that was what I was before. But that's not who I am now. I've got a new identity, a new direction, a new power operating in my life, and that is the power of Jesus Christ. The problem when... It, in the book of Romans, which still is a problem today, is people are like, if you've emphasized the grace of God, people are just going to live sinful lives. Because, oh, well, Jesus saved me. I can do whatever I want. And Romans 6 is like, no, 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 no. He saved you so that you can move to an experience of life that is totally different than what you did before. You're not saved so you can continue to, to stay in the mud pit that you were in before. You were saved to walk in newness of life or live a new life. And that life is, is a life that's fully committed to Jesus Christ. Uh, Charles Colson, one of his books, talks about this, this era of time just outside of Kiev during the, the communist era where this KGB rushed into this room where a bunch of Christians were gathered and, and, and worshiping and, and kicked the door open and they said, this meeting is illegal. If anyone wants to not deny he's a part of this Christian movement, he can leave right now. If you stay, however, you must be willing to pay the price and suffer the consequences. And so they're all standing there like, oh, these guys got guns. You know, they're in there. And with terror on their faces, two or three left the meeting. After which time the officers said, anyone else want to join those who left? No one did. Keep your hands up, they said to those who remained. And we'll put our hands up too and worship the Lord with you. You see, two weeks ago, we broke into a group just like this and got saved. But as KGB officers, we know that if people are not fully committed to Christ, we cannot trust them in our company. <laughs> Changes everything. He puts in the middle of that verse, you see, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, there's this kind of parentheses in the middle, and then he talks about the new possibility at the end of the verse. But he, he says, you know, the resurrection is important. What happened when Jesus rose from the grave? You see, he died on the cross, and then he rose from the grave. It was a proof to all of us today that what happened on the cross was acceptable to God. It was like God had, had stamped our, you know, oh yes, payment in full. Justice is satisfied. You know, the the judge's gavel fell. Boom, yes, there is an appropriate judgment for sin. My son bore it on the cross. And his resurrection was the seal and the sign that what had been accomplished on Friday was good. And now it opened the door. It was the hinge event for all of us now to, to experience life. You see, up to that point, everyone in the history of the world, every single person, no matter who they were, no matter where they came from, no matter how rich or poor or educated or anything else, all of them faced the same reality, the great equalizer, death. Boom. The pharaohs, you know, they tried to bring everything with them, and, you know, people still do that today. It didn't work. 
We found that stuff. It didn't actually make it to the other side, right? Everyone is trying to find a way out of death. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's what makes for a good story, what makes for a good movie. I mean, we, we, we all you know, the, the, you know the, the cup of life and all these kind of things, cryogenics, all this stuff. How can we extend and live forever? Because this was the reality of history. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along, boom, and he beats it. Because at death, whatever you were is what you were. You can't go back and rewrite the story. You all know that. There's no way to come back. And, and, and you know, we, we love to you know, just fantasize about that, right? I mean, there's so many movies about that where people you know, time travel and go back and change things so you could, you know, you, you could you know, rewrite your, your story, blah, blah, blah. You know, and and it, it just doesn't happen. But then Jesus comes along and whatever had defined everyone up to that point suddenly was different because he went through death and he came back. And so the reality is, like, wouldn't you like to go through death and come back? Of course. What's the one way you do that? Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus died and rose again so that we don't have to die and enter into a hopeless eternity, but we can die and rise again with him in glory and live forever with him. That the power of God, the glory of the Father, shone upon his Son in his death and in his resurrection and signified to all of us, yeah, this is good. I'm good. And you can be good now too. Just believe in my Son and, and we're all good. And we're moving forward together. And there is an opportunity for new life with me and with my Son, Jesus Christ. And it changes everything. It changes everything. Everything. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But I mean, like, sometimes you just wish you, you, could, you could rewrite your script. You could just go back and delete a few scenes from your life. I, I'm sure you have a few of those. I got a few of those. I just wish I wouldn't have done that or thought that or gone there. I wish I wouldn't have quit that job. I wish I wouldn't have entered that relationship. Whatever it is, you, you, you all have it. The older you are, the more of them you have. And then along comes a verse like this and says, guess what? You may not, you know, God deletes that script and he, he writes a new one for you in Jesus. So we can live a new life, or literally it's walk in newness of life. And that word walk is this idea of a trajectory, the locomotion of life where, where, where Jesus is now empowering you in the moment to live a whole new quality and experience of life that you didn't live before. So he's not talking about you going to heaven when you die. That's the reality of the resurrection. He's actually saying the resurrection has implications for you Right now, today, you can live a new life. I thought about you know, doing an exposition of the whole chapter. You're going to have to read it yourself. But he, he really is talking about you don't have to be enslaved to sin anymore. You can be a slave to righteousness, and you can count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. The resurrection is meant not only to bring you to heaven when you die, but also to give you a power right now in the presence to live a new life. Before, you, your life was defined by fear. Before, your life was defined by what other people said your life was. Before, your, your life was defined by, by, by how much money was in your bank account. Before, your life was defined by how, how big your waist was, how many inches of flab you could, you could caliper on your, on, your, on your love handles. I mean, all that stuff defined you, but now he's offering you a new life. But you, like me, know that this is pretty comfortable over here, isn't it? The old life. Where I'm trying to prove myself, where I'm you know, comparing myself to others, where I'm jealous and envious, and where, where I'm not loving, and, and where I'm just selfish and absorbed with my own agenda and all that. So th this is comfortable, but this is the opportunity that Jesus places in front of us. New life. We can live a new life. And even though people and Satan will remind you of some of the stuff that went on down here, Jesus doesn't bring up the past. Love keeps no record of wrongs, right? You, you, you know, Jesus doesn't say, oh, yeah, well, you used to. Yeah. He, he's like, no, you're, you're with me now? New life. He burns the bridge. And he's like, yeah, we're just going forward now. But some of us crawl back into the charred remains of the bridge and try to float back to the river to where we were comfortable. Why do you do that? 
when Jesus says, I've got new life waiting for you right here. I have another verse here, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is also a new life verse. (laughs) Read it with me. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. Okay, do you believe that? You are in Christ means basically, yeah, you've identified with him publicly. You've made that step of faith. He's like, now I'm giving you the new opportunity. That's gone. What used to define you? What used to control you? What used to hold on to you? Now you're moving forward with Jesus Christ. And the whole reason we have this opportunity is because Jesus died and rose again. The resurrection opens the door for us to move forward and to experience the new life in Jesus Christ. And so we can approach life differently. In 1799, the armies of Napoleon were coming up to the city of Feldkirch, Austria. Uh, You know, Napoleon had been rolling forward and then the the local citizens got together in the town hall and they they discussed, what are we going to do? The soldiers are coming. It's Easter Sunday. Oh, how are we going to do this? What's going to happen? After much discussion, the dean of the church rose and said, my brothers, it is Easter day. We've been reckoning on our own strength, and that fails. Let us turn to God. Ring the bells and have service as usual, and leave the matter in God's hands. So they agreed to do as he said. Then from the church towers in Feldkirch, there rang out the joyous peals of the bells. In honor of the resurrection, the streets filled with worshipers hastening to the church. The French soldiers heard the sudden ringing of the bells, the joyous bells, and it's with surprise and alarm. They concluded that the Austrian army had arrived to relieve the place, so they hastily fled before the bells had ceased ringing. Not a Frenchman was to be seen. The resurrection changed everything. But in our day-to-day, you look around, you wonder, man, does does it really, does it really Leslie Newbigin was a, a bishop. He was a missionary, an anthropologist. He had gone to the mission field for a couple of decades, and he returned to England. And he returned, and he found, like, whoa, what happened to the UK? Like, all these people have abandoned church, van and God, and are just so secular. And, and it, was, it was like, like you know, so, so they were interviewing, you know, Bishop Newbigin and asking him about this. Like, oh, what do you think about this? You know, are you, are you pessimistic? And, you know, what, uh, you know what, what's happening? And, And Newbigin's reply was powerful. He said, I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen. And so maybe today you're here, you're watching online, and you're like, yeah. But Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah. But Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But the past church history, there were some horrible things done, you know, under the banner of the, of the cross. Yeah, but Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Sometimes Christians can be mean. And those church people seem to always be fighting and leaving churches and never working things out. Yes, but Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Yeah, but my dad or my mom, my grandpa was just a big legalist and judgy and critical all the time. yes. But Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Churches will not measure up to the standard of Christ all the time. Christians can be judgy and critical. That's horrible. Yeah, I don't. And if, if that's who you are, don't come to New Life because we don't want that here. We aren't into that. And we're going to fall and we're going to blow it and we're going to crawl back into the coffin sometimes and live like we're still dead even though Christ offers us new life. But the truth of the matter is Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We just got to, that, that fact just doesn't change all this other garbage in, in the world in which we live. Yes, we still live in a world of sin. But he invites us to leave that behind and to take steps with him to conquer sin, to deal with sin. You see, the, the penalty was dealt with there. The resurrection was the imputation of power over sin. It was the the gift of power. Yeah, now you can walk and not let sin define you anymore. And that's a daily journey. That's living the life of the resurrected Christ every day. That's what he invites you to. 
So for us, Easter is not some religious event where we just get together and we talk about this historical event that happened and we just go on living our life. For us, Easter is, yes, Christ died for me. Christ rose again so that I can walk daily in the newness of life. And Jesus is going to change me as I walk with him. But he doesn't force you into this. He invites you into this. You can believe in Jesus Christ for salvation and linger at the tomb your whole life and never walk in newness. I believe that. But why would you do that? Worried about what people think, how they're judging your body shape, how, you know, how they're criticizing you for your lack of education or money or what, all that stuff. Fear for this, fear for that. What's going to happen? That's not what Jesus offers you. And so even today, people in our city got up and they don't know this. But inside, their souls are craving for something more. Because the bigger truck, the new wife, the, the highest caliber hockey team, whatever else they're striving for, the sales target, blah, 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 the perfect retirement, none of that seems to really be catching what, what they really need. And the scripture tells us, yes, in Christ you're a new creation, a new opportunity, a new life. Walking with Jesus. So we're resurrection people. He invites you to that. Don't judge Christ on all the failures of his people. Just judge him on, on his own merits. And you'll never be disappointed. We're not going to always get it right, even here at New Life. But Jesus always gets it right. And that's why I point him past me, past our leadership, past our staff. Follow him. <laughs> He's offering you this invitation to experience new life, to walk in the newness of life. If you're not walking with Jesus, you're walking somewhere else, and it's over here usually. But he says, you've been baptized, you've been identified, you've died, you've buried the old stuff, now move forward with me. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I'm inviting you to, to believe in him and, and to, to walk in newness of life. And if you know Jesus, this text is like all about not letting sin have dominion over you. You don't get saved and think, oh, I'm good, I can live. No, you get saved and you're like, now I want to really get experience the fullness of what God has for me. We move past the cross, past the tomb, into resurrection power. And Jesus is inviting you to that today. It's step by step, day by day. It's becoming more like him and less like your old self. Of course, a lot of the old people come into this church, the old self. We drag that corpse with us sometimes into church. And there's some ugly stuff that comes with that. But as we grow together, we slowly throw that thing back into the hole. Okay, oh, that, guy, that shouldn't be here. You know, let's throw it back in the grave and let's bury that because I'm walking in newness of life. What was, what I used to be is no longer who I am now. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And he wants to live in you. Team, would you come up? We're going to prepare just for the final song here. Do you feel like that truth is, is real in your life? I hope you could discover that today. You don't need to walk over there. You can move with Jesus. He wants you to experience this newness of life, to be defined by, by him. And, and you belong to him, and you're walking with him. He invites you to that today. And so let's, let's pray, and the team is going to lead us in that closing song. Maybe some old parts of your life have come up that you're currently living in and, and the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, you know, this needs to get thrown into that, that grave. I encourage you to do that today. Lord, we repent of those parts of our nature that were defined us before we knew you, before we committed our life to you, before we surrendered to you. Forgive us of our sin. And we accept that invitation to walk in your newness of life. Guide our steps every day. Help us to become more like Jesus and to walk in that resurrection power and less to depend on our own strength and our own power. We trust in you today, Lord. 
And for that soul, that person here or online that doesn't know you as their Savior, may they just hear the the love of God and the the heart of Jesus for their their own life and the invitation and respond in faith and say, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Christ. He died for me and rose again to free me from my sins, to forgive me, and to give me an opportunity to walk in the newness of life. And so, Lord, strengthen us for that, we pray in Jesus' name.